All right, you guys, it's chapter 68 of Inner Demons. And without further ado, I'm going to get straight to it. So I'm not even going to waste no time. I'm going to get straight to it because I just finished telling you guys <clears throat> one of the Mexican Mafia stories. And I want to get this next Inner Demons out as promised. Anyways, like I always do when I go, you know, when I get into these Inner Demons episodes, I always listen to the last episode so I can kind of catch myself up and, you know, pick up where I left off. And <clears throat> in the last episode, there was a lot going on. I told you guys about how, you know, I was looking at my case and I was kind of going back and forth with my attorney about some things that, you know, that I had seen. And again, you never, you know your case better than anybody else. When you've been through the legal system and you've caught these kind of cases before, you find out that nobody will put the amount of work into your case as you. They might put in some, some hours you know, as an attorney, because their reputation is on the line to an extent, but public pretenders, they're only going to do so much. You got to do that extra legwork in order to really dig down into the nuts and bolts of your case. So let me, let me tell you guys like this, let me just put it in perspective without going too deep into the mumbo jumbo. So I told you guys, we just came off of a search warrant that they did in the county jail, the agency that spearheaded these cases, Santa Clara County Specialized Enforcement Team, came into the county jail, they hit our cells, and they basically took all our property. At that time, all our property went to another attorney's office. Their job was to go through everything and to make sure that there was nothing in any of our legal work that would be considered as gang-related. Gang-related indicia is what they call it. Anyway, so, you know, the whole time that I'm over there in AdSeg and, you know, I got a lot of free time. We're over there. We're in our cells nonstop. We don't really come out. We come out maybe twice a week for yard. So most of that time we spend is back there in our cells, going through our, our legal work or maybe, you know, working out, playing chess, doing all that good stuff. So I'm going through my legal work and it was like pulling teeth to get discovery from the district attorney. They didn't want to give up nothing. But, you know, the main crux of my case at that time, it all relied on the search warrant. I was the only one, as I told you guys in the last episode, that had legal standing to challenge search and seizure issues because I wasn't on parole. Everybody else, all my other co-defendants, everybody was on parole. They were on active parole. And when you're on active parole, it means that you don't have those rights, the normal rights that you know a normal citizen has, that you don't have your constitutional rights. All those rights are taken away from you while you're on parole. So I had legal standing to challenge everything that was, you know, noted in my search warrant. Now, let me kind of put this in the easiest, most simplest perspective as I can. So on the face of the search warrant, what they had that substantiated the search that they did on the, the house that I was in, not in Campbell, not at the apartment that I got into that shootout in, but the new house that I moved to on the east side off of King. Now, what justified that search, what they say justified that search is when I got into a shootout in Campbell, they went over there and, you know, after everything was said and done, they went in, they searched that apartment. They found a bunch of paraphernalia. They found a bunch of gang indicia. They found some you know, a bunch of stuff that they considered was gang related, whether it was red clothing, pictures, whatever. So they use all that stuff, including the information in the police reports that, you know, this guy was in a shootout and it was considered to be a Norteño Sureño type of uh, incident that basically involved a shootout. So that was what was on the, on the, on the face of the search warrant. Now, what really substantiated the search warrant was what was contained in the sealed portion of the affidavit. Well, basically it's an affidavit that's in the sealed portion of the search warrant. It's somebody who gave them information saying that, you know what, I know that boxer's selling dope. I know what he's doing. He's hooked up with these individuals. He's out here running a street regiment. All that is in the envelope that's a part of my, my search warrant, but I can't see it because they're protecting the confidential informant and they don't want to expose his identity because they want to still continue to use that individual. So that's all fine and dandy. We got to go through the process of attacking the search warrant. So I'm in my cell, I'm digging through everything. So I go through all the pictures that involved, 
you know, the, the shootout on Impala, the before pictures, what they consider the before pictures, before they searched, and the pictures that were taken after the search. And as I'm going through them, I noticed that, and I remember the way that I left the apartment. You know, I had to leave out of there fast. I had just got into a shootout. I knew the cops were coming. I was dropping money. There were guns everywhere. There was dope in the house. So I bounced out with my lady. I was initially, before I got into the shootout, I was sitting there with Pony getting ready to count money. He dropped the envelopes on the table. So the envelopes were still sitting on the table with money in them. Now, when I go through the pictures and I look at the pictures, it's obvious that the before pictures, it showed the envelope on the table. There was a couple envelopes and they were sitting on the table, closed up. You couldn't see nothing. Those were all before pictures. Then I went through all the pictures that they supposedly had taken after the search that documented all the, the you know, the contraband that they claimed that they found. And it was clearly before and after. So what I noticed, you know, just through continuously looking at the pictures and reading the reports was that those envelopes were clearly sealed. They were on the they were on the table in the living room, closed. There were you couldn't see nothing. You wouldn't know what was inside those envelopes. It could have been drugs. There could have been money. There could have been anything. But to the naked eye, you couldn't see nothing. However, when I looked at the pictures of the contraband that they said was in the condition that they found it in when they came in and searched, it clearly showed those envelopes were opened up and the money was fanned out. So the reason why they fanned that money out is to justify a search. They said that they came in and they seen in plain view a large amount of U.S. currency sitting on one of the tables. This is what the cop said when he first entered the apartment right before they arrested Angel. So he said he came in, they, they caught Angel in there, they arrested him right there, they took him out. And they said that they, they stayed there and waited until a judge, a magistrate, signed the search warrant. But in the meantime, they walked through and did a cursory check just to make sure there wasn't no bodies or anybody hit. But while they walked through, they took some pictures. They snapped pictures of how everything was, the condition it was in. Again, when I looked at the pictures of everything that was supposed to be in the condition that they found it in, afterwards, it showed that that money was fanned out. So when my attorney came up, I'm like, look, man, you got to, you know, you got to check this out. And I think I'm on to something right here. And at first, like I said, he was just like, nah, man, you know, that's not going to really get us nowhere. And he wasn't really tripping on it. But after I really kept pushing the issue and I showed him and I made, look, dude, you need to check this out. I don't care about nothing else right now, but you need to pay attention to what I'm telling you. Put your ego and all that good shit aside. If I didn't think that I really had something, I wouldn't waste your time. So he finally listened, right? He finally listened and I pointed everything out to him and he was like, fuck, you're right, bro. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why I'd never seen this before. So he's seen the pictures and he's seen that we, you know, that, that I was on to something and that we might have a case to get the search thrown out. Is there going to be a judge with balls big enough to dump a case like this? Probably not, but at least for appeal reasons. And, you know, there might be a judge that, you know, he might say, you know what, this is a huge case, but I got to follow the rule of law. And according to the law and what I see right here, what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. I won on a 995 motion before I beat a three strike case. So, you know, to me, this was like familiar territory. It could be deja vu all over again. Did I really think it was going to happen? Hell no. But anyway, so, you know, we're getting ready to file a Revis hearing for a Revis hearing, and we're going through all the motions to challenge the search warrant. And we're pulling law. You know, we pulled a, I, I pulled another case that was out of Santa Barbara that was almost identical to my case. You know, the search warrant, it they went to a house. Something happened at that house. It led to a search at another house. And then everything just kind of unraveled from there. But let me tell you guys what happened. This is this is the good part. So we schedule a hearing to go challenge my search warrant. We go down there and it's called a Revis hearing. I'm pretty sure it's a Revis hearing. And basically when we went in there, we challenged it. We showed the judge, look, this is what we got. We're challenging the face of the search warrant. We had to do it in two parts. First, the face. Then secondly, we had to attack what was in the sealed portion. So when we attacked the face of it, 
you know, we go in there and we say, look, we there's a shootout that happened on Impala. That's not in debate. It happened, and they, this is the evidence that they had. Now, when this happened, you know, these are this is the pictures that they used, and this was the evidence that they brought in. And so part of this hearing, you know, it, it involved the actual cop that wrote those reports and the cop that says that when he came in, that he found that contraband in the condition that he found it in. So he comes in, my attorney, you know, he plays it to a T, man. He's he's like, so, you know, when you got there, what happened? And he let him hang himself. You know, you got there, you came in, you, you knew, you thought somebody was in the apartment. So, you know, first you secured the apartment, you arrested that individual. From that point on, what did you do? Well, I took pictures of the actual apartment. Things that I seen that led me to believe that there might've been something more going on than just a shootout. I, be I believe that based on a large sum of money that was in clear view, that there was drug activity at this house, that he basically felt like there was just cause to substantiate a search, that they thought there might be drugs in that house based on the large sum of money. So he's telling this cop. So when you came in, he started taking pictures and he throws up the pictures. So that was, that's, a right there. So when you came in, you took B right there. And this is a picture before you touched anything, correct? Yes, correct. So we get to the picture of the end table where the envelopes are at. So this was the condition that the end table was in when you first came in. You hadn't touched nothing at that point. Absolutely. We go on to all the other pictures. So then, you know, we box them in. We get to the pictures that they said that they took before they touched anything. And again, you know, the condition it was in before they searched and those pictures showed well this was when after they got the search warrant and again they went in the second time to show how you know everything was the way that it was in the in the in the apartment and in that picture it showed the money fanned out so my attorney he's he's got this cop on the stand and he's got him on the ropes and you know in this first hearing right here the main cop that was on the case, Sergeant Livingston, he came in and at that time, you know, it was, it was just all bad. He came in, I, I seen him walk in, I looked over at him, he looked at me and he sat down with the prosecutor. So we got this cop up on the, on the stand and we got him on the ropes. So then at some point, you know, when we go through all the evidence, my attorney, he goes, well, I want to bring something to your attention. He said, these were the pictures that you took when you first came in and that you believe that there was a legal activity going on based on the fact you've seen a large sum of money in plain view. It's called the plain view doctrine. Anyways, so the cop says, yeah. So my attorney goes, okay, well then how, help me understand this. Explain to me why in this picture, which it clearly shows that you said you took this picture of the contraband and the condition it was in before you guys touched anything. You already swore, you gave sworn testimony on this. Why is that money fanned out? And that cop knew he messed up. You know you done messed up, right? I mean, you know, you know you fucked up, right? I mean, you little bitch. You know. <laughs> so he knew he was caught and the judge was just glaring at him. The judge was glaring at him. And the cop could not, he could not give a viable explanation of why that money was fanned out. He already had testified to it. He couldn't say, oops, uh, I made a mistake. It, it don't it don't work like that. He adamantly testified against that. He he, he documented police reports. There was a chain of, of, you know, evidence of where that evidence, how they handled it from the, the time that they seen it, from the time they collected it. It's called a, some type of chain of, of evidence, how they handle it. But those things are, are meticulously done and they're all documented. So he was boxed in. He couldn't justify why that money was fanned out. And from that point on, the judge got on his helmet. He was like, you know what? You're lying. You're clearly lying. I think you went in there and you fanned that money out to, you know, to give you justifiable cause to search that apartment. You believe that there was drugs in there, but you really didn't know. This was on a hunch, but you lied. The main thing is, is that you perjured yourself. You're lucky I don't throw you in jail. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and dump everything that you used from that search on Impala. Everything that you found or you collected on Impala because of that shootout, it's gone. So now what you're left with is imagine you got that, that search warrant. 
everything that I can see on the front of it, it's all gone. It disappeared. They can't use that now. Now, the only thing that substantiates that search is what's in the sealed portion that I can't see. So I'm already, I've already won one victory. It's a major victory. I'm like, yeah, we got them, right? That part of the search warrant is gone. Now we got to attack the second part. So we go into another hearing and in this hearing, because they want to keep the confidential informant protected, they don't, they want to keep them, you know, confidential. They, they don't allow you or your attorney to look at the sealed portion. What happens is the judge goes in the chambers and he reads through the whole search warrant, the part that's sealed. And he'll make a determination of why he feels like it's justified. If the information is good, if it was firsthand, you know, if it was secondhand, if it was hearsay, all that good stuff. So he'll make a determination based on what he thinks, based on what's contained in that affidavit, right? You guys following me? So when we go in for this hearing, the judge had already, you know, re supposedly reviewed the, the search warrant the part that we're not allowed to see. And that's basically the only thing that's keeping me in that county jail at this point. So, you know, it took around four or five months to fight this part of it right here. And then it would end up going another year after that. But this part of it, understand this. So the judge, when we go into this hearing, when we go to court that morning, the judge is like, you know what? I've been on this bench for X amount of years. And since I've been working as a, as a magistrate, something happened this morning that has never happened to me during my entire career as a judge. So I go to look at the sealed portion of this affidavit that's supposed to be in the envelope that substantiates this search warrant. I go to review it to make a determination on it. And there's nothing there. Come to find out the clerk, his clerk, the judge's clerk, contacted the agency, which was Campbell, and found, you know, found out what happened to that to that portion of the search warrant. What did you guys do with it? It's supposed to be in this envelope. It's supposed to be, you know, in the courts, filed in the courts. It's not there. Where was it at? What did you guys do with it? Well, come to find out, Campbell PD had that in one of their lockers one of their evidence lockers. And after so much time, I don't know, a year, maybe, you know, two years, they purge it. They basically go through it and say, you know what, all this stuff we don't need. And somebody accidentally threw the search warrant away. They destroyed it. So this is another major fuck up. And I'm like, bro, you got to be kidding me. I tell my attorney, are you serious? What happens from this point? The judge doesn't have nothing to go on. He can't make a determination because there is no, there's nothing in the envelope. So I tell my attorney after court, like, what's going to happen? You know, wh wh where do we go from here? He's like, dude, we, we, we got him. You know, there's a chance this case is going to get dumped. And it's not, it's not a matter of whether the judge thinks you're guilty or not. It, this comes down to them making all kinds of missteps as far as the chain of evidence and what they did with the, with the search warrant. So, the judge, meanwhile, while we're in the hearing, the judge, you know, he's like, so I can't, I can't review this. I don't know what to do in this situation. Well, the district attorney stands up and he tells him, your honor, we actually did a Revis hearing on this case in department such and such. When we did that hearing, that courtroom recorded the search warrant on its minutes, meaning it's got a recorded copy that the clerk has in their files over there. Because we challenged it, they went in, they, they looked at the search warrant, and they looked at the seal portion, and they documented it. It's all put away. So we said, there's a copy of it over there on the minutes. You know, it's as simple as going down there, pulling it, and having it copied. So the judge says, I'll give you a week to do it. Go down there, get it, bring back that copy, and make sure that it's a signed copy. It's, you know, I want to make sure that it's, it's a signed, legit copy, and that it wasn't doctored or documented, you know, after the fact. And the district attorney said, no, your honor, this is all documented in the you know district attorneys. It's in their system. You know, in order to go into that system, you would be able to see that it was accessed because everything is time stamped and it's all documented for anybody to go in there and review it or go in there to copy it. It would be logged into the computer. It's a sealed network. There's no way around it. So the judge says, good, I want you to bring me that as well 
the the you know the documents that show that it's a sealed network that nobody accessed it from this date to this date that it was never copied and i want you to bring in your it it guy to come in and testify as to that and everything started to look like it was it was good it was going in my direction so the next week we come back to court and the district attorney comes in there and says you know what your honor we went to department such and such to get that copy that you wanted and unfortunately, for some reason, for whatever reason, I don't know, they didn't make a copy of it. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Is this like some some crazy luck that I never get? Like, is this really happening? Every step, something else was happening. It just started to get better and better and better. And it honestly looked like I was getting somewhere with this case. So now they don't have it. And the judge demanded that they bring it back and that it be signed and that they have a, a record of it and all that. So the district attorney stands up again and he's the last makes the last ditch effort and says, look, I can bring you the copy that we have on our network that was, you know, generated before it was signed. The, again, it's not accessed. You can see the timestamps and all that stuff. So the judge was like, you know what? I told you I wanted a signed copy. However, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to have basically have the main officer that was spearheading the case come in and testify as to yeah that was a legit copy and that you know have your it guy come in and testify yeah that was a legit copy that was never tampered with and none of that so he basically backtracked on his word so they come in it gets better than that though they come in they testify Livingston comes in, testifies and says, yeah, that's a true and correct copy of the one that, you know, the original that I got. That's exactly how it was. The IT guy comes in there and says the same thing. And then they provide evidence of the timestamps. So at that point, you know, the judge is like, you know what? I know this is going to come back on an appeal, but I'm going to go ahead and let this fly as, you know, a legitimate copy, a legitimate copy that wasn't tampered with based on the evidence um, and the testimony of, of the two guys that came in and testified about it. So I'm like, man, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. So, you know, my my attorney, honestly, he was almost in tears. This guy knew I was looking at life. He, he fought every step of the way during that hearing. He threw everything he had at him. I mean, he was fighting. When it was all over and done with, Seriously, he was almost in tears. He was like, hey, I'm sorry, dude. I know your life, you know, is resting on this. And he's like, this is some bullshit. He even told him in court, man, you know what? This right here, this case is the most egregious case that I have ever seen. We had found even another case out of Santa Barbara that was almost identical as mine. It showed that there was a, a search of a house that they did. And basically they used a search from another search the evidence that they use in another search to substantiate the other search that they did right i know probably confusing some of you but basically they let me let me say it one more time something happened at one house they used that incident to justify searching the second house and then again you know they had information that was provided by a confidential informant well Everything was identical. They went through all the motions, were fighting the search warrant. And when the judge went to review the search warrant, two pages of the search warrant were destroyed. They had purged them somehow. My whole search warrant was purged. This one was only two pages. And even those two pages, it wasn't even the real like nuts and bolts, like the, the main crux of it. There was just some good information in there, but it wasn't the main part of it. Just based on that, that that case right there, they dumped that guy's case. So we use that as law. This was like this set the president for law in this area because law was great when something like this happened. When somebody loses a, an entire search warrant, what do you do? So this kind of set the precedent. But the judge didn't even he wouldn't even let that fly. It was crazy. So so check this out. So we get denied. Everything's denied. And, you know, now when I'm back up in the cell and I'm going through that whole process again of how we fought that, you know, from the first day to where we had everything thrown out in the, the Campbell shootout to everything that happened in the Revis hearing to how 
you know, the, the judge said that the district attorney had to bring in another copy with the, that was signed. And then they brought in a copy from their IT guy that showed the dates. Well, when I looked at the dates, which I don't understand why nobody else caught it, the dates were out of whack. They were completely backwards. And this, you know, you would think that a judge that's supposed to review this stuff, a, a district attorney that was supposed to have all these facts in order would look at this and say, hey, look, look at the date. This, this is not even the right year. But this date that's reflective on, on this right here is supposed to be huge because this is this is to show that this wasn't tampered with, but it was the wrong date. So it was crazy. So from that point on, we we filed we filed a writ with the California Supreme Court, which basically put my case in limbo for about a year. I had to wait until the California Supreme Court, you know, came back with a decision on on my case. Hopefully they would see that there was missteps all along in that whole process and they would dump the case based on everything that happened. Well, the California Supreme Court, those of you that are familiar with, you know, how those courts work and all that, it's it's a sham, you know, because a lot of the times they don't really even have to look at it. They'll just send you back a one liner that will basically say refused to review. They don't even have to go in there and see what it involves or nothing. So I don't know how what the process is, how they do it, how they make a determination on which case they'll look at and which they won't. But I got a one liner back basically saying that refused, denied to even look at. So I was back at the starting board as far as what to do. You know, I got defeated. What, 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 what could I do? Should I take a chance from this point on and just bank on that, knowing that, OK, I got an ace in the hole, regardless if I get convicted. I got good appeal issues, you know, in pocket. However, nothing is absolute. Nothing's for sure. You're still, you're taking a huge chance. You can get one of those judges that just, it doesn't matter how egregious the evidence is, they still rule against you no matter what. You got hardline judges. So although it looked good and, and I felt good about it, that I might have a lot of good appeal issues, that still takes, you know, you still have to take a chance of, getting convicted, taking that life case and going to prison with a life top. And then hoping that, you know what, I hope my appeal issues are good enough to save me in the end. But it doesn't always work out like that. So anyways, that's the legal part of it. So that's all that legal mumble jumble stuff that all was happening at one point while I was down there in AdSeg. And, you know, it took a while and the case went in limbo for a minute. But the beat still had to go on, you know, so it did. In the meantime, in between time, you know, I told you guys how when Livingston and, and Bob Messer from the Department of Justice came up when they did the search, they basically, well, Bob Messer basically, you know, he came over to the attorney room I was in and basically told me that, you know, hey, if you don't help yourself, something big is going to hit you in the chest and wah, 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 you know, to, to cut. Ready? One, two, three. You know, he said something big was going to hit me in the chest and I was going to go down with the rest of the fellas. I was going to get buried under an avalanche. And I was like, man, what, do, what are you going to do? You know, you, you're threatening me like like I got the death penalty hanging, hanging over my head or something. You know, I'm already looking at life. I'm a three striker. Do what you got to do is basically what I told him. So from that point on, you know, I knew that Something was going to happen. And the only thing that I knew could happen was that they were going to hit me with an indictment. Whether it was going to be federal or state, I didn't know. But I knew that something was coming. They basically, I mean, they tipped their hand and they told me. But the, the crazy thing is that, you know, this was already, we're already like a year, two years into me being in the jail. And these cops are still trying to proposition me. They continue to still, you know, approached me about cooperating. Hey, you know, time's running out. The window's closing. If you don't act now, you're going to lose an opportunity before somebody else jumps on the bus. Do what you got to do. I kept telling them over and over, you're wasting your time. It's not going to happen. Again, you guys got to understand if it was ever my intention to start throwing people under the bus because I was looking at a life case, I would have done it from Jump Street. As soon as they propositioned me while I was at my house, when they first raided me, I would have did it then. But that was never 
it was never my plan. It was never a plan of mine. It was never something that I ever really considered. What I told my girl on the phone was between me and her. And I explained to you guys why I said what I said. But I think that these cops, while they were monitoring all these phone calls and listening to us, you know, make all these calls and try to get all this money off the streets, they were also listening to the calls where I'm on the phone talking to my girl and my mom, and they're trying to get me to cooperate. And, you know, they heard me telling them that, you know, I was open to doing it. And I think they ran with that. You know, hey, he's talking about doing it. Maybe we can get him to do it. But in the end, I refused to do it. I continued to tell him, do it, do whatever you're going to do. But you're wasting your time. Quit coming up here trying to talk to me. Now, from that point on, I don't remember exactly what date it was. I would have to look in my in my legal work. But from that point on, all four of us back there, me, Sykes, Pony, and Joe, we all knew we were done. We knew we were going to get buried. And, you know, at that point, we were all like, just like, fuck it. You know, if it's going to come, hopefully it's going to be a federal, it's going to be a federal indictment. And that's that's the energy that was back there. Who gives a fuck? And we were back there continuing to make phone calls because we didn't care at that point. We're like, if it goes federal, you know, we might as well just go all in. And that's what we were all thinking. So by then, some of the attorneys, you know, they started contacting each other and they started sharing information with each other and they started, you know, sharing their resources with each other. And there started, there was a buzz that started to, to float around. The buzz was that we were getting ready to get hit with an indictment. And everybody knew it was coming at that point, but nobody knew exactly when it was going to come. You know, all our attorneys were in contact with each other and somebody had heard it from somebody. And it's common, you know, in the legal community, they all share information together. The prosecutors with the lawyers, the lawyers with the judges, the judges with the clerks, they all share info together. So when something like this comes down, even though it's supposed to be in secrecy, anytime a grand jury convenes, it's supposed to be done in secrecy. Nobody's supposed to know that, you know, a grand jury has been convened for whatever reason the case is being, you know, prosecuted. It, it's supposed to all be done in secrecy. But we knew ahead of time we were going to get indicted. And then finally it came on again, whatever date it happened, it happened. And like I told you guys before in other episodes, this case was the biggest thing that was going on in the county jail at that time. When we got indicted, the day that the indictments hit and that morning they came up and said, you guys all got court. You guys have all been indicted. They slammed down the entire county jail. And they walked us through the court tunnels one by one. They made a big spectacle about it. These indictments were huge. Everybody and their mother in the county jail was talking about it. You know, Boxer, uh, Joe, Sykes from Goshen, Pony from East Hills, and all the other guys that they brought in. It was John Santa Ana. You guys will see a picture of those that got indicted, including my associates, Thug Love, Juanita, you had Roger and John Santa Ana were considered associates. And then you had a lot of other guys that were brought in on the indictment that were either under me, out there, you know, on the streets that were actually plugged into the regiment or who were working close enough with us to where they got indicted as well. So you guys will see a picture of that on the thumbnail but again, you know, we all went down there one by one. We got escorted down there. And it was like just everybody that went to court that morning, it was like we all got a chance to see each other all, all again. Because most of the others that got indicted had just came in like a day before. They just got arrested. And, you know, this was the first time a lot of them got to see us. They had a slam down in that part of the jail where nobody really got to see us except for, you know, the guys that were in the snake pits or guys that were housed in the old jail. All the homeboys that were on the fourth floor, that were on the seventh floor, those that were in, you know, Elmwood, none of them got to see us. So when we all got down to the courtroom, it was like everybody was back together again. We seen some of the females that we hadn't seen in a long time. Thug Love was there. Juanita was there. Pony got arrested with some other female named Barbara. She was there. Roger Carranza was there. They had put him in Brown because they knew that the police reports were coming out as part of, you know, this indictment. And from that point on, it was all about 
well, how bad is the indictment? What are the charges? And it took, I want to say it took the judge close to 40 minutes or the clerk 40 minutes to read all the charges. There was, I want to say 18 of us, 18 or, or 15 of us, but it took a long time to read all the charges. And you had all kinds of attorneys in there that some of them were in it above their head. You had other attorneys in there that had been a part of the 92 indictments. So they were familiar with how to attack these kind of cases. You know, these were some serious cases. They had hit us with a lot of crazy charges. Some of these charges were trumped up. And, you know, again, I think a lot of the attorneys that they appointed to some of my co-defendants were in it way above their head. You know, later on, that would all get confirmed when, you know, we would start fighting the case and just some of these attorneys were trying to file just basic, you know, basic motions that they were in it way above their head. It was crazy. It was a spectacle to see it, uh, you know, play out. But, you know, during that first court appearance, when, you know, they started reading the charges and this was the first time that I got to meet my new attorney. Because once the indictment came, it changed the dynamics of the entire case. Now, everybody had to, only one person could be represented by the public pretender. Everybody else had to have a private attorney. Otherwise, it would have been a conflict of interest. So there was a lot of new attorneys in there. Some guys were just now meeting their attorney for the first time. Everybody had to have different attorneys or it would have been a conflict of interest. There couldn't be multiple people that were being represented by the public pretender. Only one person could be represented by the public pretender. And then only one person could be represented by the alternate public defender. And then you had everybody else that had to have separate, you know, private attorneys. I got stuck with the public pretender because I was one of the first ones that, you know, that was on the case. Everybody else kind of came after me. So, you know, but which was cool because my attorney was a good attorney. He was a young guy that was out of Fremont. He used to be a homie when he was younger. And then, you know, he got his life on track and, you know, he got into to law. So he, he kind of knew what was up and he kind of didn't know what's up. He had family that were involved in the game. And, you know, it was cool having an attorney like that because he knew what time it was. And his thing was, you know, he really, he really didn't want to represent somebody that was you know, cooperating. His thing was like, you know, I got love for a lot of dudes that stand stand down on what they believe in. And, you know, I respect you for that, you know, because at that time, that's what, that's what I was doing. I was fighting my case and I was staying loyal like I was supposed to. But anyways, when he came into the courtroom that day and, you know, I had a chance to talk to him about the case and I was listening to the district attorney kind of give an overview of what the case consisted of, what they were using, how it was all tying us together. And it, they had mentioned something about 4,600 4, phone calls or something like that, that was part of the case. That's when a light bulb went off in my head and I was like, 4,600 phone calls, what the hell? Where'd they get all those calls from? But basically what they were is phone calls from all of us. Everybody that was in the county jail or everybody that was making phone calls from the county jail to the people out there on the streets or other people that were talking about the case, anything that they could find, everything that they thought was relevant, you know, was included within the 4,600 phone calls. So I, I was thinking at that point, it's already a couple years later, you know, you guys got to understand the phone calls that I made in the observation cell were during the first three weeks after I got arrested. This is two years later now. I got my bearings under me, my, my, you know, I'm firmly committed to fighting the case. I'm digging myself into a deeper hole. I don't care about, you know, I can't honestly tell you guys that I didn't really care about catching a life case, but I was at peace with it. I was to the point of, you know what, I'm going to do life. This is, I knew this was coming years ago and I'm okay with it. I had got clean by then and, you know, I had my bearings back under me. So, but when I heard the phone calls, I was like, there's phone calls. Damn, wait a minute. Remember those phone calls you made when you first came into the county jail almost two years ago while I was in the ob cell, when I was like at my weakest point? I wonder if they included those. And I was like, nah, they wouldn't. For what? They're not relevant to the case. It's just me talking to my girl, my mom, that's really got nothing to do with the case. Those were just some personal phone calls. So I kind of thought that they were, but the more I thought about it, yeah, you know what? I could see the district attorney trying to utilize this as, you know, a, 
as some cards as a way to play his hand. And I told my attorney right there, dude, I don't care about nothing else. All I want you to do is get me an iPod, like get it signed today that I'm authorized to have an iPod and download those phone calls ASAP. I need to go through those phone calls immediately. And he was like, why? Is there something that you're worried about? And I told him, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, I'm worried about it. You know, there's there's some things that I said on the phone that I shouldn't have said, even though it was just between me and my girl and, you know, family. It's still, if those things are, are released, other people might, you know, misinterpret that and take it out of context. So I want to know so at least, you know, I can implement some damage control. And that's what I told him. So, so I want to say within, it was within two days, my attorney was able to get the phone calls all downloaded on a little iPod. And then, you know, he got the court order authorizing me to have it. And then he also got the transcripts from the grand jury indictment. None of us knew who had told at that point. We didn't know. It was, you know, in the, the transcripts. And until we got the transcripts, no, no, none of us knew. We didn't know who told. We didn't know who testified. None of that stuff. So when my attorney brought up, you know, the iPod with all the phone calls, he also brought all the transcripts. And it was a stack. It was a stack of, of transcripts literally from like, it's probably like two feet high. I don't know how many thousands of pages it was, but there was a lot. So I remember that day when I was back there in ADSEG and they called me out for an attorney visit and I went out there to the attorney visiting room and my attorney was like, look, I got the iPod. Here's the headphones. Here's the court order. You need to keep that in the cell. Here's how you work the iPod. And at that time, I didn't even know how to work an iPod. They had just come out in what, 2000, 2005, 2006. They had just barely came out. So he gives me that. Then he gives me this big stack of transcripts he hadn't even went through it yet he's like dude i haven't even been through this yet i don't know you know who's testifying i don't know how bad it is i went and did all the everything i needed to do in order to get you this ipad cinch or this ipod since you you know really expressed that it was important to you so that's what i did so when i went back to ad say you know the fellas were waiting i told them that you know i had been waiting for my attorney to to get the iPod that he was, you know, in the process of it so that, you know, I, I'd have those phone calls and that also he was copying all the transcripts. So everybody was waiting back there. They were waiting for me to come back to ad say, you know, and, and go through all the transcripts and go through all the phone calls and all that good stuff. So, you know, this right here is a good place to end it. Yeah. I know the viewer that always says that, that they hate, or they dread when I get to the point to where I say, you know, this is a good time to end this episode. All good things got to come to an end, my boy. I'll be back with another episode, though. I want to continue to do this, you know, the way that I'm doing it in, in sections. And I don't want to, you know, give you guys too much in one episode and then just get to the end of this. I want to give you as much as I can and be as detailed as I can. So, you know, the next so the next episode will be about what was actually on the iPod and the transcripts and what happened back there when I came into the, you know, to AdSeg with everything and the conversations that happened and everything that happened from that point on. And that's when it's going to get good. That's when you guys will hear about Pony the Phone Slayer. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope the legal mumbo jumbo didn't confuse you. I hope I was able to articulate it in a way that you guys understood how I got played on that search warrant. Santa Clara County is cold. I'm telling you anywhere else that search warrant would have been tossed out straight up, hands down, San Francisco, probably even Monterey. You know, I clearly had them beat and they knew it. But again, you know, unfortunately I got a judge that didn't have balls big enough to follow the rule of law. He went out of his way to continue, you know, backsliding all the way, every process, every court date. He came with something else. The district attorney kept throwing, you know, something else at him. We can do this or we can do that to save this. And, you know, they work together. 
that case should have been dumped at that point. It didn't matter whether I was guilty or innocent. At that point, they had fumbled the ball. But that's what happens. You know, that's what happens. And these types of cases right here, they don't want to dump them. There's politics involved. Anyways, again, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Inner Demons. I'll be back with episode 69 either tomorrow or the following day. We're trying to get out as much content as we can to you guys. I hope you guys see it. I know you guys appreciate it. I've been reading all the comments. Again, I appreciate all you guys. I'll continue to interact with you and I will get with Jay Hands and we'll put out the next episode of the Black Widow podcast. It's on me. The reasons why we haven't done the next episode is because I've been caught up doing other things, but we'll get that next episode out as well. Anyways, with that being said, I'll be back tomorrow night with another Mexican Mafia story. I'll try to get you out another Inner Demons. Again, I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is your boy B, and I'm out.